I think I've just been playing with the idea, and I'm interested to get your thought on it, that in taking an appraisal over time and listening to people, when they give me a list of things that they find palliative and stretching makes it onto a list, probably if we're kind of trying to refine the data and parse out the signal from the noise, probably because that's the only thing they know. Right, like, like stretching is first, uh, you know, first cab off the rank, as an Aussie would say, when it comes to an intervention, something is tight, stretch it. Probably it has to do with a very superficial understanding of what a muscle or why a muscle gets tight to begin with. But I've been playing with this idea of like, it seems to be, and not always, but it seems to be more effective in those where any type of like, I guess, what, what, is, what is the straightest line to this point? the more deconditioned a person is, the more meaningful that tension on the muscle seems to be. And I think it's never a conversation that's had about, well, what is the, what is the stimulus threshold of this muscle? Like if a muscle can stretch under, you know, some sort of a uh, hundred pound dumbbells, then sure, anything less than that's probably not going to check a box in the nervous system. But one thing that I've seen repeatedly, at least in like, alleviating symptoms around pain and discomfort is it seems to be more effective if the baseline tolerance of the muscle they're stretching is zero because it's probably something and this is just I, i'm kind of spitballing this it seems to me that that's probably the closest thing tantamount to exercise that people might be getting right like if we look at some sort of conventional rehab of like isometric eccentric it's like well they're in some sort of isometric or eccentric. Maybe this is the only load they get. Now, would they do better with some sort of dynamic range through a concentric phase and then back into eccentric isometrics? Like, yeah, probably. But I think that's never really been, at least in the circles that I've seen these things contentiously debated, never a, a, a layer of nuance that I've seen that more recently, as I think about it, I go, well, maybe the baseline the uh, threshold, the baseline ability of the muscle comes into play as so far as the stimulus being meaningful or not. Thoughts? Yeah, I think that if you talk about that, if you flip that over to the fat loss, loss side of things, it's basically the, like saying the obese person, if they lie on the floor and just roll around for 10 minutes, they're probably going to lose a bit of weight because they're actually moving and not sitting on the couch and stretching in that regard is like, okay, if you're not if you're sitting on the couch and you don't ever load into any kind of deeper hip flexion, knee flexion, ankle flexion, spinal flexion, stretching in those positions is giving you some load. So your muscles are getting, your body is getting a little bit of a stimulus that it's not usually getting. I would coincide those thing, two things together. And I think in that, in that case, if someone was very inactive and the activity that they liked doing was stretching, I wouldn't dis discourage that. But I would probably try and slowly over time encourage some other things as well. And yeah, that's that's my thoughts, <laughs> I think. It's always tricky because I think we in consulting and speaking with and educating therapists, one thing that's always tricky is, and I think you know, you talk about an athletic population or at least a population that you don't need to motivate to actually do the rehab and strength training and all that is the majority of the rehab space is not that, right? It's not the population that's performance oriented. Like it, it is yeah. people who are coming in primarily with paying goals and not performance goals. I maintain that if you've still set the horizon to performance, you're easily and quickly eclipse pain if that's your end goal is to move better, faster, faster, uh, higher, longer, whatever the, the metric objectively is. When, when it comes to confirmation biases, how do you wrestle with the efficacy of interventions between those two things, toggling between novelty and specific variability? Because novelty, you, like you said, like old mate rolling around on the floor, this is very novel. I'll make the comparison of like, imagine, you know, you, someone, you didn't know a lot about nutrition. You were on public transit on a bus somewhere and some big bloke sat next to you and was like, hey man, how do I lose some weight? Uh, maybe just a quick rundown of thermodynamics, calories in, calories out, go for a walk, eat salads, or in this case, roll around on the floor. Um, I'm going to use that from now on. <laughs> but if Usain Bolt sat down next to you, it would be like, hey man, how do I run a 19, 19, 200 meters? How do I get faster? It's like, well, you need specific variability right you're going to need a specific intervention there and salads and rolling around on the floor ain't going to do it for our boy bolt how is it that you how do you help keep or, or advise people to keep an open mind around interventions that maybe might not make sense when they work and maybe don't cast this this 
this this uh, this aura of like, oh my god, I did this and it works. Therefore, I do it for everything. Like, how do how do you advise trepidation? How do you advise on uh, the humility aspect that comes with therapy? Because sometimes I'm like, I don't know, I have no fucking idea. Do you feel better? Yeah. Sick. We'll do that. 